Welcome to Worship with Christ, Indianapolis United Methodist Church, on this last Sunday in June. We are blessed today with worship leaders, Jerrica Patterson and Scott Hudson. And we are blessed today with beautiful bouquets on the altar. One of them is in honor of Stephen Joy Schultz's 50th wedding anniversary celebrated on June 27th. The second bouquet is in honor of Jesse, Danita, Jameson, Genevieve, and Jefferson Mullins, who will be celebrating a farewell drive-through uh, this afternoon, sponsored by the Staff Parish Relations Committee from 2 to 4 p.m. Please follow the directions as you come onto the church campus and plan to greet Jesse and his family under the main entrance canopy. Again, 2 to 4 today. The first reading is from Psalm chapter 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death and my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The Lord is with you. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today as people of faith, people who know you will provide even when we cannot fathom how. Just as Abraham trusted you walking up the mountain with Isaac, we continue to follow you and trust your guidance. Lord, we are beyond grateful that when doubt and fear creep in, you can bear that burden. We thank you and praise you for your unfailing love. God, I pray that you give us strength to love as you have taught us to love, wholeheartedly and unceasing. When we may have difficulty navigating how to love others, Remind us to be faithful and follow your lead. And we all say, Amen. Hello. A reading from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham? And he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He him, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father? And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And a reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. 
And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, Jesus commissioned his disciples to preach the good news to the ends of the earth. Today we send our friend, Pastor Jesse Mullins, to announce the gospel in new ways, in a new place, Cicero United Methodist Church. With hearts open to the Spirit, let us listen to God's word. From Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. How then can they call on one another that have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God feeds us with the word of life. Let us pray for our brother Jesse Mullins that God may continue to nourish him with this living word. For God to fill his heart with compassion, his hands with strength to do the Spirit's will, and his mouth to speak Christ's peace to all, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For all ministers, for the Holy Spirit to bring to completion the good work begun in them by Christ. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For this community, for comfort in the absence of our friend and renewed commitment to the vision of God's reign, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For the Cicero United Methodist Church, that they will receive our brother, Jesse Mullins, for a gracious welcome, a generosity of spirit, and genuine care for our friend and his family, Danita, Jameson, Genevieve, and Jefferson. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who long to hear the word of God, for those who are poor and hungry, for those without work, or companionship. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us now ask for God's blessing upon our brother. Lord Jesus, word made flesh, from the beginning of creation, you named and claimed us for yourself. Look with kindness upon your servant, Jesse Mullins, who leaves this community affirmed in your call, fed by your word, filled with our care, and sent to be your presence to all he meets. Guide him on the way and bless him with your wisdom, that he may be a word of hope for a world in need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Our current series of messages in Kingdom Tide is about doing. Uh, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. Our quote this week is taken from Shakespeare from his play Troilus and Cressida, Act 1, Scene 2, and the quote is, Things won are done. Joy's soul lies in the doing. 
We have two texts for this week's lesson. Uh, one is taken from Genesis chapter one, chapter 10, pardon me. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac and their journey to the mountain. And the second is from Matthew 10, where Jesus talks to his disciples about what they can do. It's not always that our opening quote is reflected in a post that I find on the media, but this came from HuffPost, and it was posted by Seoban Kukulik. Uh, in 2017, she wrote about joy's soul lies in the doing. Um, as much as we think we'd be happiest when we reach the top of the mountain, we actually are happiest on the journey. She says, some days I don't think I can fit it all in. All of the hockey and the dancing and the organizing and the running of the house and the chasing after kids and the homework and the birthday parties and birthday gifts and groceries and laundries and commitment. And we would add to that during lockdown all the at-home school and at-home work. But she says, quoting Gretchen Rubin in The Happiness Project, the days are long, but the years are short. If we wait for things to calm down and return to normal, um, it's probably never going to come. We're wasting time. The time to be grateful is now. Author and philosopher Eric Hoffer has said, the hardest arithmetic to master is that which enables us to count our blessings. So let's take a moment and count our blessings. Stacey Lisherin wrote recently about a train ride she took in New York City, counting her blessings. She said, I was riding the subway home after having dinner with a friend, and there was a young woman seated opposite me on the train, and she noticed my cast and asked me how I injured my leg. I said, well, it wasn't my leg, it was my foot, and I'd fractured my fifth metatarsal. She asked if she could lay a healing prayer on me. I said, if you think that's going to help, go ahead. She asked if I would mind if, I, if she touched my leg and said the prayer right now. After weeks of having subway riders ignore my cast, only begrudgingly give me a seat, and then if I ask them to, bumping into me and kicking me and never saying excuse me, I was touched by her small act of humanity. Much to the delight or dismay of the other passengers, I really didn't care which, I extended my leg into the middle of the subway car to meet her reaching hand. She held her hand on my foot through five subway stops. Now, I don't know if it was the power of her prayer or the display of her unexpected kindness. But my steps were a bit lighter walking home from my subway stop that night. Things one are done. Joy's soul lies in the doing. And the doing in the Bible often is a doing that involves a journey. The Genesis passage today has God saying to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you about. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two young men with him. And his son Isaac cut the wood for the burnt offering, went to the place God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw Mount Moriah. And Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey, the boy, and I will go over there and worship and come back to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his back, on Isaac, his son's back. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went together. And Isaac said to his father, Father, here I am, my son, Abraham said. Look, father, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for an offering, my son. So they both went on together. Can you imagine the dread of that journey that was rising in Abraham's heart? Can you imagine the desolation of knowing what was ahead of him? Can you imagine the innocent trust of Isaac and his father's leading? And so I'm glad that journey ended with the great heart of God saying, Oh, Abraham, don't harm your son, your only son. I know now that you trust me. But it took that journey for Abraham to be able to demonstrate his 
trust. And then there's a story from the Exodus where Moses made Israel set out for the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur and three days into the wilderness, they found no water and there was nothing to drink. And the people grumbled and said, what are we going to drink? And Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a log and Moses threw the log in the water. And he said, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord God, and if you will do what's right in God's eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, then God promises to put none of the diseases on you that God put on the Egyptians because God is our healer. And then they came to Elim where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. Again, it was the journey that was required, a journey in faith and trust that God's leading was going to take us to where we need to go. And then there's this from Luke chapter 4. As the sun was setting, all those who were sick and with various diseases brought them to Jesus and Jesus laid his hands on them and healed them and the demons cried out and said you are the son of God but Jesus rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because he they knew he was the Christ when it was day Jesus departed went into a desolate place and the people came and they found him and they tried to keep him from leaving and Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He went on to the synagogues of Galilee. He went on to towns that weren't even Jewish. The journey was a necessary part of that three-year ministry for Jesus. I noted when I went to my very first appointment in St. Paul, Indiana, that there had only been two of us appointed to that church that had ever served longer than two years. The man that preceded me, and then I was there four years. When I went to Jeffersonville Wall Street United Methodist Church, and I looked at their history up until the 20th century, no pastor had stayed at Jeff Wall Street longer than two years. Itineration coming and going on the journey. It was part of being a United Methodist pastor. And when I took my ordination vows, I promised to go where I was sent. The journey, the heart, the soul finds their joy in the journey, not in a destination. But what are we afraid of? Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God, and God will make your paths straight. Now, that doesn't mean, at least in my experience, that the hills and valleys are ironed out yet. That doesn't mean that all the streams are bridged and ready to cross. But it does mean that God's leading will direct us on a direct and specific way we need to go. And I look back on my more than 40 years of itinerating in the ministry and I see a clear direction on paths I needed to go. At the time, as we approached those journeys, we didn't always agree that those were the best things. Sometimes we were devastated by the journey that we set out on, but at the end of it, at the end of it, we always were able to say this was a good thing and this was a God thing. So how does trust in God work? Well, Psalm 56 says, God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can anybody do to me? In God, I trust. What can any people do to me? I think that's the first thing trusting God gives me. If you will, it's a fearlessness. Nothing that people can say or do is beyond or above or able to eclipse God's purposes and plans. In Isaiah 12, it's written, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord my God is my strength and my song has become my salvation. So not only am I not afraid, but God gives me the strength I need for the task. Isaiah 50, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of the servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord your God. So even when I think I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God's light is shining. In Ephesians chapter 5, once you were in darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. So walk as children of the light. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So not being afraid, 
finding our strength in God, coming out of the darkness, letting God be our light, and then letting God's light living in us make us into light for all the dark places where we go. That's how this faith and trust in God works. But how big do these steps of faith have to be? Well, today's gospel and Mark's gospel in ninth chapter both say, if indeed anyone, if you give anyone even a cup of cold water because you bear the name of Christ, truly I tell you, you will not lose your reward. I think a lot of people hold back thinking, well, I can't really do anything for God. I don't have the resources, the time, I don't have the gifts, don't have the ability. I can't do anything big. And no, you can't. Mother Teresa once spoke to that. She says, none of us are going to do great deeds of love. We're going to do little bitty things, small things. But we can do every one of them full of Christ's love. In um, Matthew 25, it says, The king will say to you, truly, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. So whatever little thing we do for the most ignored and overlooked and unloved people, whatever little thing, even a cup of cold water, that's done for Christ. It will be noticed. And then in Hebrews 6, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown for his name as you have ministered to the saints, as you are continuing to do so. Anything you do will be your soul's joy for joy lies in the doing. Christopher Hill wrote about a journey that he took a couple years ago. He um, was trying to figure out why 10,000 people a year make the stomach-churning passage to Skellig Michael, a desolate rock pinnacle, eight miles off Ireland's southeast coast. From spring to early fall for the last 15 years, the ruddy-cheeked carryman John O'Shea has ferried passengers across the roiling Atlantic from Derrynane Harbor to Skellig Michael, that rock outcropping, aboard his stripped-down fishing trawler. It's only one of 14 boats that are authorized to make the journey. If conditions permit, you land on the 54-acre rocky crag. And if you don't, then the passengers have to hop from a pitching boat onto a concrete quay, and then they have to walk up 618 stone steps that are rough and narrow and slippery with their damp, which is most often. There's not even a flimsy handrail as a barrier between you and the hundreds of feet of roiling ocean below. And all of this is so that you can View the scattering ruins that are 714 feet above sea level. Why would you make the journey? Well, Mr. O'Shea, the man who runs the boat, says, I guess they're trying to figure out what those guys were doing out here, the monks that built this place. Those guys built it between A.D. 600 and A.D. 1200. The physical traces of their community remain, but they're battered by wind and rain and storm. There's the remains of Celtic crosses marking their graves. There's a primitive church. And then there are the beehive cells that they built with uh, flat stones that they just built in a circle, ever diminishing diameters until they built a beehive hovel to live in. They had nothing else. Their primitive church, their graveyard, they had their cells. They had the pinnacle. They had the ocean. They had the rocks. Why? because they wanted to experience God in the most personal and stripped down way possible. For 600 years, they prayed and sang and read the scriptures and drew ever closer to God. That was the monastic experience. Several people were on that boat with me. One was a 40-something couple wearing, wearing matching jackets. They finished each other's sentences. There was another husband and wife pair that were on a birding trip and they already saw a six foot wingspan northern gannet on the voyage over. A university student from Cork in yellow blue jeans and blue patent leather high top sneakers said he was nursing a hangover but he just still wanted to see it. He says it's part of who we Irish are. He was only wearing a t-shirt, no jacket and freezing to death. 
There was an elderly man in rumpled clothes, a tweed cap. There was a friend with him and his daughter, a 50-something blonde with gold sparkly sandals and red painted toenails. She was 30 minutes late for the boat, latte and iPhone in hand, and she never got off her iPhone. He said excitedly, I've been waiting to see Skellig Michael for all me life. First it was a minuscule bump on the rise and then it grew. And as the time came that we were alongside the quay, it loomed large over us. We could not see the top. A jagged, sheer-walled monolith of black gray rock, crusty orange lichen, bright green grasses exploding out toward the sea. I craned my neck. Once I hopped onto the land, I took the path up the stairs. As I was going up, there was a young man coming down, fit, 20-something. He was on his seat, inching down step by step. I prayed I didn't get that terrified before I reached the top. When I got there, I wasn't disappointed. It was amazing how exposed that little settlement and its ruins were. Everything was windblown and misladen, and below us there was nothing but the ocean and the sky. George Bernard Shaw went there in 1910. He said, an incredible, impossible, mad place. I tell you, that thing does not belong to any world that you and I have lived and worked in. It's part of our dream world. Where our writer said as he finally made the journey back, he felt like he was awakening from a dream. He felt like that what he had experienced out there just wasn't real life. And he was eager to get back to real life. Are some of us feeling that way with opening from the pandemic shutdown happening more every single day and yet the looming reality that in places the pandemic is spiking again and the unknowns of what will it be like when we come back together will we ever get back to normal i would offer dear friends no but this journey we're on is necessary Will we discover a deeper being with God because we've taken the journey? Or will we always be wishing for a destination that is always slipping further away from us? Dear friends, the soul's joy is found in the journey, especially when it's journey with God. And remember, a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And whatever you do or dream you can do, you have to begin it. And the only impossible journey is the one we never began. Let us pray. Oh, help me, God, to understand that every precious day in this journey that we're on, a journey that has taken us from an overwhelming pandemic to now, the hope, the glimmering hope that there is an opening world before us. Help me understand that every step of this journey, you've been trying to speak to me, gracious God. You've been trying to give me the strength that I need. You've been trying to give me the fearlessness that I need. You've been trying to give me your light shining in this darkness. Help me, gracious Jesus, to take what you're offering instead of demanding what I want. Help me, Jesus, to be your faithful disciple, trusting you for the journey, as Abraham trusted you for the journey, as Moses trusted you for the journey, as Jesus trusted you for the journey. And we all say, Amen.
Find a place, guide us with your grace. 